All right. Welcome, welcome, and thank you for joining me today. My name is Justin Seitz. I lead up the team at Dark River Systems who builds Hunchly and does a bunch of other stuff. And today we are going to cover some new stuff coming in Hunchly, mainly, really only, uh, our new revamped report builder. So this has been a long time in the making and a long time coming. I'm also going to cover a very cool project called Aleph from the OCCRP. So we're going to dive into that both as kind of in a general sense and also how I bring Hunchly data into Aleph. We're just going to kind of touch on it. And then we're going to talk about a very cool technology from Chasm that allows us to run secure investigations out of the cloud. Now, I'm not going to be able to dive into each one in great depth and detail. I do hope that there's enough interest that I can do uh, individual webinars on each of these things, but definitely I wanted to show off some of this stuff for you. A bit of housekeeping. This webinar is being recorded right now. I can see it uh, recording. And so if you have to drop or you run into any technical issues, don't fret. There's not much I can do to troubleshoot things right now uh, once we get going, but this will be posted to our YouTube channel and I'll show you where that's at at the end of this webinar. And of course, feel free to ask questions. So we're booked for an hour. I may or may not use that entire time, but ask any questions you have. If I can't answer them specifically, whether it's about Hunchly, whether it's about Aleph or uh, Chasm itself, I will definitely follow up with you after the webinar. So thanks again for showing up. And this should be a, a ton of fun and you should really get a really nice kind of display of a bunch of uh, different really cool things um, that we have in store. So what we're looking at right now is the Hunchly dashboard. And actually, this is a pre-release alpha version that has our new report builder in it. Uh, I'm also going to show you a form where you can sign up and you can actually grab this new release and start testing it. And we also have a feedback form. So I'm going to punch that into the question and answer box, send it to all of you so that you can see it. Feel free to sign up and take it for a spin. So what I did was I just did a very simple, short kind of miniature little research project where I headed off to Bellingcat and um, I found a, a great article by Alberto there, uh, who's amazing. Uh, go check out his work there on Bellingcat. Follow him on Twitter. Incredible researcher. Uh, and I just kind of looked at Boko Haram for about 15, 20 minutes, collected a bit of data, um, you know, used some selectors, a tag just to kind of uh, build it out a little bit. And kind of left it at that. And really, the goal of this was to just kind of show how some of the things that we've been using in Hunchly for a long time, uh, like selectors and tags and you know notes and images, all of this stuff, even attachments, for a long time, you weren't really able to use them in a reporting sense, right? Our report builder was currently the one that you have right now was not super flexible, was missing a lot of features and was a bit clunky to use. So you can see that I have built out at least, you know, kind of the main areas of an investigation that you would normally see and that you would normally use while I was looking at this. So this will actually be a fairly quick demo because the new report builder is really easy to use. And naturally, this is also, as I mentioned, an alpha pre-release version of it. So you'll encounter bugs just like I have, and we want those bugs, and we want to make sure that it's implemented, the fixes are implemented before we release them. So if we open up the report builder, this looks significantly different than our old one, right? And the reason is, is that this new kind of layout and this new way of building reports is much more flexible, much more user friendly. So when we first start out, and if this looks a bit foreign, the first thing that we can do and what I obviously like to do is I can create a title page. So before this was kind of automatically generated for you. So in this title page, I can put my name in as an author. I can put in an organization name here. I can just put Hunchly. I can add a logo directly from here for example. So this is much more flexible. If I want to add some text, I can easily do that as well. And I can fold this up and get it out of the way once I'm done with it. So again, the UI and the UX is much, much friendlier, much easier to kind of manage larger, more complex reports. Now, I'm ready to actually start adding some case data. So I'm going to create a new section that's just Bellingcat research. So I'll just put that in first. Cool. And now that I'm able to add case data by clicking here, this will look a lot different. 
So we have a few different options here that allow you to drill down into your content that you've captured, pull in screenshots from page captures, and as we add more to it in subsequent releases, you're going to see more and more features and more ability to kind of pull more content into your reports. So if I wanted to just add some, you know, again, just the Bellingcat stuff into this section, I can simply just go in here and say, I want to add this screenshot. I can actually say as well, if I have notes or captioned images. So in this case, this was a captioned image that Alberto had used uh, in his story of some satellite imagery. So I'm going to add this in and add them to the report. So now what we have is a much nicer layout, and we can also kind of see, based on the color coding, kind of what we're using within the report, so we have a better idea of what's going on. If we need to move it around, shuffle things, that's a much easier thing to do as opposed to how it was before. And we can also move these sections around, as I will show you later. Now, if I want to add some text to this, I can. So, you know, amazing research by Alberto, as usual. And same thing, I can move this around, I can reorder these sections, I can change how this layout looks and works, uh, changing you know, where I want things, adding text in between, all of that stuff, which is much, much nicer. So now that I've got some stuff in my Bellingcat research section, I'm gonna show you how we can also bring in stuff that's been tagged. So Alberto's uh, article includes some links to videos that are on YouTube and I tagged at least one of them. So I'm gonna go back in and add some case data. And here's where we can start to go in and we can look at using our tags and selectors as filters when we're looking at um, content that we've captured, right? And we wanna report on it. So if I wanna filter this down to videos, I can do that. So here's this. This is a screenshot from the YouTube video that I had uh, captured. So this makes my life a lot easier. As I'm building out these sections, I can actually build them out based on tags and based on selectors, which is something you just couldn't do before. So a much, much easier way to handle that. And same thing, I personally continually fold up sections. You can add one in between if you need to. So if you wanted videos at the bottom, and here's another cool one. So if you've pulled down documents during your investigation and you wanna add references to those documents, very easy to do. We can go back into add case data. I'm gonna unselect the video tag because I'm not using that. I'm gonna to go to attachments. So here's a report that I had downloaded from the US government. I wanna include this reference in my report. Naturally, that attachment is part of my case data and a full case export is gonna export that attachment. But it's really useful because when we print out a report, we're gonna have a reference now to that document itself, where it came from, and of course the reader of the report is going to be able to see where you got it from as well, and you don't have to do any kind of uh, funny monkeying around with screen sh screenshots or other things uh, to achieve that. All right, so again, we have a few sections built. Much easier to build bigger reports, reports that include more content, more sections, uh, because it's not this giant kind of drag and drop thing. And again, you can actually pull these sections around. So if you decide to reorder your, your report, you can totally do that, very simple. You can add more sections to the bottom, much easier to deal with. And our goal is naturally what we learned from all of you as users is that you wanted a reporting tool that might not do 100% of what Microsoft Word does, but you wanna get it as close as possible for as many uh, cases as you can. And really, this is the foundational building blocks of being able to do this, kind of give you that flexibility, allow you to bring in more content into your cases, sort them, filter them, all of that fun stuff. So I can then export this report. Just like always, we can pick PDF or Word if we want. So I'll kick it out to PDF and we'll save it to my desktop much the same way. So in my pre-release build, there's a still a, and I'm actually, I think, using an older one. There's still a few bugs kicking around, but we see some of the stuff that we've added here. We have some text paragraph that we wanted to include. Of course, I only wrote one line. The usual stuff that you would expect to see, so caption images and notes, all of that fun stuff. Here's our video section where I pulled in that YouTube video I had tagged. And this is, again, one of my favorite things because often pulling down documents uh, during your research is something that we all do. And being able to reference this here is great. This description field, of course, naturally comes from 
when we are uh, in our attachments right here, right? So this is something I've kind of been saying lots in our webinars is make sure you're annotating the documents you download uh, so that, you know, when you export them or when you're looking at it later, you actually know what it is. But now it becomes even more important because it allows you to actually, those annotations get pulled into your reports when you are doing, uh, when you're actually building reports out and including attachments. So again, it's very simple to use, very uh, flexible. There's a lot of different ways that you can pull content in and out. Uh, we actually pull out extracted images as well. So you can do things like if you're looking for an image that was extracted by Hunchly automatically, you can start to use our filtering. You can start to kind of pull stuff out that isn't a screenshot. It's not something you caption, but it might be something that you do want to include. So again, what we're looking for is number one, to continue to find the last few bugs that we can uh, so that we can get them patched up before the final release. But also we're looking for people to test this so that it, you all can tell us, you know, this is great. This is what we like. I don't like this or I do like that. And where you can sign up to do that, I'm just going to pop a link in to the chat. I'll actually pop it in two spots depending on where you're looking. I'm going to put it in here. So there's the link to get hooked up for uh, early release testing. And as well, we're always looking for feedback. So if there are things in Hunchly that maybe not report builder related, other things that either you want to tell us good job on this or needs improvement or I absolutely hate this thing over here, here's the feedback form where you can send that to us. So I'm just going to send that also into there. So it should be in your chat box. Feel free to go use either one of those forms. Either you want to join up to do some testing, you want to uh, send us some feedback, let us know what you would like coming down the pipeline in 2022. Whatever it might be, we're always definitely looking for that feedback. Now, if you have any questions about this report builder or what you've seen so far, now's a great time to ask them. And I'm just going to pop over the Q&A box and see where uh what we have for questions all right so we do have a bit of a technical support question uh so uh made a screenshot of the facebook comments but in the report the written stuff in the screenshot was too little to read is it possible to make it bigger in the report so that's a great question and definitely uh if you're running into specific issues like that our support team wants to hear that so i'm just also going to send you here's where you can reach out to us the other thing is uh, I generally export to Word if I have to move or stretch or change things, if for some reason uh, something just doesn't fit right for me or that kind of thing. So again, depending on you know what you were seeing specifically in that capture or where the comments were too small to see, let me know, uh, let our team know, and we can either give you some tips on how to work around it or uh, give you some tips on how to how to try to prevent that or deal with it in the future. Um, definitely would be interested in seeing that uh, capture as I know my team would as well. Awesome. So another question, is there a preview option before exporting? No, but definitely Phil will be here if he's not here already. Uh, I guarantee you uh, he's gonna wanna know that, he's gonna wanna hear that. So if previewing a report before exporting is something that uh, folks would like to be able to do, we want to make sure that we're addressing that. And again, that's a great thing to punch into our Hunchly feedback or when you're doing the report builder stuff, if you feel like testing, uh, definitely let us know some of those things. Uh, currently, it's what you see uh, I've shown you so far is our intended first release, uh, sans a few, of the, uh, a few of the little bugs. All right, great. I have another person saying, yeah, preview would be very good. So that's awesome. Again, Phil will be picking up some of this feedback and uh, and we'll definitely be talking about it in-house. Great. Was there any other questions that I can answer in general, report builder or other things um, that I can uh, that I can help to answer? All right. Can attached documents to the report builder be hashed? So the documents themselves are always hashed. So you always get a hash of these documents and that hash shows up in the report as well. These are these files are not uh, embedded inside of the report, right? So we we're not able to like embed a, a Word document or anything inside the report, uh, but definitely we can add the hash in here to make sure that that's included in the report because the hash is calculated here. So that's definitely something that I can uh, that I can pull forward to my team to include that document hash 
uh, in the report. Awesome. Thanks, Jim. And great to see you today as well. The release is ready to download now, I believe, actually. So uh, someone had just asked, when is the pre-release ready to download? Uh, I believe it is ready to download now. So if you fill out that Hunchley Report Builder form, uh, you can definitely sign up and I believe you'll be able to get access to it right away. All right. Any other questions I can address before moving on? Doesn't look like it. All right. Cool. All right. So now let's talk about Aleph. So if you've never been to aleph.occrp.org, I suggest that you do so. Aleph is amazing. So they host a, a public instance of it. Uh, they have, as you can see, uh, 336 million public entities, a bunch of data sets, all kinds of stuff. So if you wanted to type in like Vladimir Putin into Aleph, uh, and again, some sources are hidden if you don't have an account with them. Um, but what this is, is this amazing system that allows you to shovel any kind of document that you want at it, video files, all kinds of stuff. And what it will do is actually ingest process, do entity extraction, pull out email addresses, phone numbers, names. It will OCR images for you. It does some lightweight metadata extraction on images as well. And it's amazing because their public instance, of course, is where they're storing a ton of different things. So you see by expanding this data set column here, we can see that they have all kinds of stuff. So if you're interested in a particular person or a business or anything like that, you can just kind of drive down into these data sets and see where they might be turning up. Now, the other cool thing is that this is a fully open source project. Okay, so this means that you can deploy your own Aleph instance and start to work with it in your own investigations, whether you're in law enforcement, whether you're journalists. This thing is amazing, and I have been using it for, I guess, about four years. I worked with some journalists about four or five years ago uh, on a project, a collaborative project, and we used Aleph extensively. I have a private instance that I use uh, in-house, and as you'll see today, I also deployed one to a cloud. So this is, uh, this is deployed on DigitalOcean. It's just a, a very simple instance that I set up. Uh, it does not take very long to get Aleph running. It's all in Docker containers. Uh, so again, if you're ever interested in me covering, like, here's how to set it up and get going with it, definitely something we can do. Now, you'll see that I have zero public entities, public data sets, or anything else. You can hear my uh, my burner phone going off there because i got to use that shortly, too. Um, so the cool thing is, is that this is all kind of locked down. You can actually add things like Google Authenticator and... There's other methods for authenticating to it. In this case, I'm just going to sign into it. And I'm going to show you some cool stuff. All right. So mine is not nearly as impressive as the OCCRPs uh, naturally. But I want to show you a few things that you can do with Aleph. And then I'm going to also show you how I ingest Hunchly data in pretty cool ways uh, and push it into Aleph itself. So one of my favorite things as well, uh, just kind of looking here, is you have the ability to set up alerts. So if you're working within a team, and again, this is designed for collaboration. So what's really useful is you can start to put in terms that might be useful to you, um, basically selectors, uh, if you're thinking in, in those terms. And then you get alerts based on any time there's a document or something that matches that selector one of your colleagues has put in, you'll be able to get an alert on that, okay? Now, the other really nice thing is that Aleph kind of allows you to work both in a, in a contained space, in an investigation of your own, or you can kind of publish your investigation or expose it to your organization as a data set. So I'm going to show you both of these things and show you some of the tools, and I'm going to also show you how I took that Boko Haram uh, research and pushed it into Aleph so we can explore it a bit. So I'm going to create a new investigation, and we'll just call this... <laughs> Oddly enough, the one thing that caught me my eye the other day was the Truth Social app. So this is like uh, Donald J. Trump's new social media platform. All right. Now, this languages field is pretty uh, interesting because it's used for when um, it scans images for text. So if you know there's particular dialects that are used, like, for example, you know you're going to be dealing with Russian. Whoops, I clicked away from it. Sorry. 
uh, we're going to be dealing with Russian. We might be dealing with, uh, you know, I don't know, other languages you can think of, Arabic, right? So what this does is help to guide the, the optical character recognition. And then you can also choose who to share this with. So if you're in an organization where there's many journalists, many investigators, you can be selective. So in this case, I'm just going to share it with Phil so that only Phil and I can see this investigation and work on it, collaborate together on it. All right, and hit save. Cool. So now you are kind of got this investigation. What can you do with it? Well, one of my favorite things is that you can actually sketch a network diagram to kind of kick your investigation off, to start out building up some entities. So I'm going to create a new diagram, and I'm just going to call this a Truth Social App Network. All right. And I'm just going to say drawing out the network. Cool. So now I get this very cool drawing interface. All right. So for those of you who use Multigo or i2 or other uh, kind of network visualization tools, very similar thing. However, the very nice thing is that this will actually start to seed my investigation with entities of interest. I'll show you how this works. So I'm going to add an entity, a person. So I'm going to say Donald Trump. Cool. So now I have Donald Trump on my network graph. Okay. And I'll add another entity that we'll call a company. And I believe it is the Trump Media and Technology Group. Cool. So now I have a company, right? And I can also link these two together. So unless I've been missing something for a while, I believe you have to use this kind of manual link generation. You don't draw it like in Multigo. So I have the sources, Donald Trump. I pick the Trump Media and Technology Group. And then I tell it that it is a directorship, which I believe it is. All right, cool. So now we have this little diagram that shows that. And then recently, again, as I'm doing research, I learned that Devin Nunes, I probably pronounced his name wrong, has also joined the company. So I'm going to link Devin to the Trump Media and Technology Group as an employment link. Very nice. And I can continue to build this out if I want to add that the fact that he's connected to the US Congress, I can say public public body. There we go. Very nice. So again, and I can continue to build this out. Now what's happening in the background is as I'm drawing this diagram out and kind of mapping out my investigation, it's creating entities that can be kind of mapped to, searched for, and uh, we can use later in our investigations. Now again, uh, I am not going to be able to do all of Aleph justice today, for sure. The OCCRP has some amazing videos on it as well, uh, but I do want to show you some of these things. So if we go back to our investigation, we can see now that we have people, companies, directorships, employments, public bodies. All of this is super useful. But really what we need to do is start uploading documents. Now, this can be anything from a source has provided you with a big folder of documents and you just want to shovel it up, spreadsheets, whatever it might be, you can upload it here and Aleph will ingest it. So I'm just going to grab a PDF and I can send this up to Aleph. Now, my instance is a little underpowered at DigitalOcean, so it's not uh, uncommon for me to completely break it. And we can see this little spinning wheel. And you won't see these documents appear right away because there's a number of processes that happen in the background. And the cool thing is, is you can always get a high level overview of what's going on in the system here, right? So we can see there's a job pending. It's doing its thing on that document. This is really nice because it'll just do this in the background. I can keep shoveling stuff at it. Uh, I can annotate the, the entities. I can kind of click around. And for example, if you want to as you learn more things about your uh, the people who are in this particular investigation, you can start uh, adding nationalities, for example. So United States, right? You can kind of mark them out. Same thing when you're doing, whether it's cyber research, whether it is like due diligence work. This is really nice because you can really build out this kind of full investigation. And if you're in a team, people can be kind of marking up this data as they're working and as they're finding things. Now, what I really, really love and what I've been doing for a little while uh, with Aleph and Hunchly is I had written in an ingester where you can just take a Hunchly case, hand it to a Python script, and it will actually pull all the images, HTML, 
uh, as well, it will also, if it detects a YouTube video, will pull the YouTube video down automatically, upload it to Aleph, and do some of the tricks that I showed in a previous webinar where it pulls out frames and runs some object detection on it, and then it actually annotates those objects before sending to Aleph. So what this allows me to do is a bunch of crazy searches uh, based on things that are contained in images and videos uh, as well, you get the benefit of OCR where it is actually reading text out of video frames and I can search for that text. So here's what it looks like. I'm going to switch to the data sets view. So I started out with a Boko Haram investigation and then I converted it to a data set. So very simple to do. And when you have a data set, it's really nice because you get this overview of everything you have, right? So it's going to tell you the webinar or sorry, the webinar, the names. Uh, that are extracted. So this is using some NLP. There's Alberto Fidarelli from Bellingcat. Now, of course, NLP is not perfect. So you can actually get some weirdness, definitely. But for the most part, uh, it works incredibly well. We can also see, importantly, the types of content that we have here. So I'm able to see at a glance what kind of materials that we have. And this is tremendously useful to me. So if I click on videos, for example, I can see that I had downloaded some videos. Now, this wasn't me, actually. This was my case ingester that detected the YouTube videos, automatically reaches out to YouTube, pulls them down, and then uploads them and annotates them and sends it off to uh, Aleph for me. So this is really nice. Aleph has a full API, and they also have Multigo transforms, by the way. So if I wanted to review these video files, let's say Phil had downloaded, I can do that right from within here. Right, so I'm able to actually look at this video and view it right from within Aleph. This is hosted right on the instance. I also, because I've written this in Jester, it points me right to the YouTube link. It tells me who created it, when it was created, all of this stuff. They do their own checksumming as well. So all very useful stuff. Now, for example, we see a name here, Angele or Angel. So I can actually, if I want to, I can search for that name right here now this is an extremely powerful search interface interface so i can say angel very nice right so right here what this is telling me is that this was isolated from a frame and i actually have a small bug in my script that doesn't take the first frame from a video <laughs> as you can see but what this was was a video frame at 2280 uh i guess those are in microseconds um or milliseconds sorry at that point in the video, we see that this name appeared here, right? So depending on the tweaking you do in how you extract the video frames, and again, we can cover that all in a future video. I just used my old script and modified it. This is really useful because now I'm actually text searching through videos, right? And normally that either requires a lot of manual work watching the whole video or some like insanely expensive video analysis platform to do it. And this is all free and open source with a little bit of Python. So this is extremely useful. It also allows me to then go see um, what was like what video this came from. And these keywords I've actually populated from Amaga. So I've isolated this uh, video frame, sent it off to Amaga. And what it's done is kind of categorize whatever it could find in that frame, which allows me to keyword search through any of these video frames that were isolated. Very, very neat, very useful, and all it was was Python and a Hunchly case export. The other thing that I noted was that for harm reduction, particularly uh, journalists, human rights uh, researchers, and others, uh, Imaga actually picks up dead bodies. So what I found was that you could actually search for cadaver, and then you know that those images right there have bodies in them. So I'm not going to open them, uh, but it's one of those things that kind of dawned on me that I'm like, there's probably a million different uses that you can kind of use this for, right? It's incredibly useful to be able to think about these terms and think about like, are there ways that we can reduce harm while we're doing some of this work? This is definitely one of them, and it was totally by accident that I stumbled upon it. And again, looking at the search interface here, you can see without having to memorize some crazy Boolean logic, um, you know, or like worrying about brackets and all this stuff, they give you this really nice 
like form where you can start to tweak your search terms. You can start to look at, you know, changing things, filtering words out and in. Uh, very, very powerful. I mean, the team uh, over at OCCRP are just, they really did an amazing job of this thing. They really thought about how people do investigative work and they nailed it. It's really, really impressive. Another cool thing is that you can begin to isolate. Uh, so for example, I'll just do a search for Boko Haram. And what you can do is actually start to isolate by entity types, right? So I just want images or I just want videos, for example, or web pages. And then you can start to dig into these things like looking at uh, web pages, you can expand this. And again, in terms of collaboration, this is really useful. So as you find things or you're kind of isolating things that are interesting, you can click and go, I can add this to a network diagram or I can start to build lists out, right? So if Phil and I are working on this investigation together, I can start uh, isolating out content or things that were of interest or entities or whatever. And as I'm reviewing them in this part of Aleph over here, I can start adding them to lists that we can begin to build as a team that allows us to kind of dive in and filter on that content. So again, Aleph is incredibly powerful and flexible. There's a million different ways that you can kind of use it, and that's really where its utility comes from. Uh, but for me personally, I really saw this kind of like the clouds part uh, a while ago um, where I was like, I, I totally need to write a Hunchly ingester for this thing. So this was done, oh, probably a year or more ago. Um, and then I started thinking about, well, how can I get video in? And then I started thinking about, well, actually, there's a lot that I can do with video, video frames and OCR. Uh, and very quickly, I was like, this is uh, definitely a match made in heaven between Hunchly and Aleph itself. So again, I'm not going to be able to dive into every single thing here. I would love to pull one of the team members from the OCCRP on sometime where we can talk about some of this more in depth. Or if you ever wanted uh, me to do a demonstration of setting Aleph up from scratch, uh, that is actually, uh, I had to rebuild this environment a couple of times uh, this week. And it's really, I, it, it's so fast and easy. It's a simple thing uh, to do, only a handful of steps. Uh, to get it deployed onto a, onto a Linux server. Um, and like I said, I run my own private instance as well uh, on, uh, on a little Intel fanless, um, you know, one of those little tiny fanless Intel units, a, a NUC, and uh, it works amazingly well. And I have hundreds of thousands of documents, pages and images stored in it. So I'm gonna take a look now at our Q&A box because I see quite a few uh, questions coming in. All right. So in the Trump scenario, I missed the part where you found a cryptocurrency field. Where was that field? Oh, a uh, cryptocurrency field. I don't actually remember seeing that. Was it maybe in the network diagrams? Was I in here? Cryptocurrency wallet as an entity? Probably that. So yeah, you can add a wallet here if you want. There are a ton of different entities here. This is largely for tracing corruption and organized crime. So you'll see that it uses a model called follow the money. Uh, I definitely want to be talking to the OCCRP too because I see all kinds of cyber entities that can be used. Normally, I just kind of work around it where I want to put an IP address or something else in. Um, but again, I think there's just so much you can do with this platform. Uh, and even if you don't want to do a lot with it, just having like an investigation where you shovel Hunchly stuff and whatever else you want at it, just so that you can jump into this text box and run searches, incredibly useful, incredibly useful. So definitely one of those things where you don't even need to, it's one of those tools where you don't need to leverage every single feature to get the most out of it. Uh, really that text box at the top, it does so much so much. All right, cool. All right. Mm, all right. Cool. So a question about how Aleph is, is it private? So if you do OSINT about extremists, uh, even this fact can be classified, of course. Um, other may find it useful that I'm interested in person X from a different uh, location, that kind of thing. So again, 
you can control who on your team gets to see the data. So in this case, this investigation here, this Truth Social app, only myself and Phil can see it. That's it. Uh, and so if you don't expose it as a data set, right, as a public data set it, within your entire Aleph instance, uh, then no one else will see it but you. OK, so the idea is, is that uh, when journalists are working in this type of environment, while it's not technically classified, they have to protect information sources. They can only selectively share things with other uh, journalists. There might also be legal ramifications. So they designed it in this way that you can do this. And again, uh, the public instance of Aleph enforces multi-factor authentication. So much the same way, you can really lock this down. Now, uh, if you are working within a law enforcement environment, you can also, because it is so easy, if you have an operation, say, that you're about to you know, um, look at a cybercrime group, uh, you can also just simply stand up an Aleph instance just for that operation that's only accessible to those users uh, within that network, right? So you can leverage some of the internal security controls at your organization so that only people uh, within that group or those the, that are allowed to see it can gain access to it. And then within Aleph, you can control even more finer grained. For example, uh, while you're doing your work, each of you may have your own investigation that only you can access, and then you can selectively allow others to see it uh, or change, uh, change who can access it. So really depending on the types of work you do, your internal network security, and also kind of your organizational security, uh, Aleph is really just something that you can deploy uh, and you can make it fit within those models. Okay, now again, the OCCRP folks uh, will have a much better understanding of some of the internal intrinsics of how some of that works. Uh, but definitely their public instance that they run, uh, they do uh, enforce a lot of that, uh, a lot of that security. All right, cool. All right, all right. Cool, cool, cool. Yes, I definitely would love to bring the OCCPR, OCCRP folks in for a, for a webinar. You bet. Is this encrypted in some way? That is a great question. I don't believe that there's any uh, disk level encryption on it, but again, like any specific uh, encryption on it. Uh, however, like where the bulk of the data is stored is in Elasticsearch, and you can configure it to store it in a different so, for example, if you have like an encrypted uh, Elasticsearch instance somewhere or you have like uh, encryption on the fly or a bunch of other things, uh, definitely you can configure it to shoot data at another instance. Again, the big thing is, is that doing encryption on this many documents and that much data on the fly back and forth, uh, both in a read write way is going to incur a ton of cost like uh, CPU cost. Uh, but most of the time people, when they worry about encryption, they're actually worried about disk level encryption, which is again, controlled by kind of the, the big iron that you deploy it on or on the infrastructure you deploy it on. Uh, if there are OCCRP folks on this webinar, feel free to let me know if you know of people who are running uh, encrypted instances or that type of thing. And again, this is all in Docker containers uh, and I am a Docker noob. So I, I know like Docker compose up, Docker compose down. Uh, so there's probably a ton of things that you can do uh, when you're deploying this in a Docker environment that can help you with that. All right, I know I'm seeing lots of people saying, I really like this and I'm like, yeah, yeah, I love Aleph. I've been like trumpeting around, uh, screaming about Aleph for a while. Uh, I really, really, it is just so cool. So cool. And it handles uh, like their instance that they run. It's massive. Like it's, it's hundreds of millions of documents. It's really massive. Uh, mine is much smaller at, at uh, hundreds of thousands, but it just works, right? Uh, if you run it on underpowered infrastructure, though, uh, you will like run into issues because it does need a bit of horsepower to run. But even this instance you're looking at right now, it's on DigitalOcean. It's a hundred bucks a month, okay, for a fairly beefy instance. So for a, an organization or a team of five, ten, twenty people, that's not a huge cost. For a, a law enforcement agency or that type of thing, you probably have big iron in house 
or virtualized environments that you could deploy this in uh, that would allow you to, to run it for effectively whatever the cost of that infrastructure is. Cool. And yes, it looks like I've had a few requests already of like how to get going from scratch with Aleph. And I can definitely, uh, I can definitely do that. Awesome. Very cool. Very cool. Awesome. I'm great. Glad. I'm, I'm glad you liked it. And again, I really didn't do it enough justice. It's got so much to it. Check out uh, the OCCRP has done stuff on YouTube as well. All right. So that's Aleph. So it's amazing, uh, super cool, and definitely uh, I will also at some point open source the Hunchly case ingester that does all the fancy YouTube extraction and all of that. Uh, the code is an absolute mess because I had to just kind of sandwich old and new uh, to make it work. Um, but definitely if we do another Aleph uh, run, I will talk to you about how to use that script and uh, I will open source it so that you can download it and test it yourself. All right, so I'm going to just take a quick sip of water. Okay. Now, I've blown your mind once. Now it's time to blow your mind again. This is Chasm. So what we're looking at is my own Hunchly um, research platform within Chasm. So Chasm is this containerized system that allows you to run both desktop environments and individual applications from the cloud, on-premise. So again, for those of you in law enforcement or regulators, you can deploy Chasm inside your building. So your data stays in Sweden, it stays in Australia, it stays in Canada, inside your building, or you can deploy it to cloud providers within your country of residence, which is a huge issue for dealing with anonymized browsing platforms and all this other stuff. So let's get logged in. And again, I will not be able to do Chasm justice in the way that it deserves, but I think you all will fully understand what I'm about to show you. Let's, here we go. Cool. So this is your Chasm dashboard. Now, there is a ton of stuff Chasm has thought of, including web filtering, all different kinds of authentication that you can use to kind of make sure that you actually can control how people authenticate to Chasm. There's just a ton of stuff here that they've thought of. I'm going to focus on the workspaces. So workspaces in Chasm are anything from apps to full-blown desktops. All right. Now, this is going to look crazy, but remember, I'm in my browser here. And the Chasm folks, who are also awesome, also led by a Justin, oddly enough. Uh, there might be a pattern there. <laughs> Boom. I'm going to jump into my Hunchly desktop. All right. Voila. That's all it takes for boot up time. That's it. Full-blown desktop. Like, what was that? Two and a half seconds? That's it. All right. So... Now, this down here is my my actual, my virtual machines. So let me get rid of some of this because this will confuse you very quickly. All right, I'm in my browser right now. See that? Okay, watch this. So let's fire up Hunchly. I think Hunchly started faster than it does on my Mac some days. Okay, so there's the dashboard. And I am inside a secure container inside of the Chasm Cloud right now. All right? so. What I'm going to do is the usual stuff with Hunchly, fire up Google Chrome. Look at how snappy this is, right? I'm just going to say latest OSINT. Well, I should actually turn automatic capture on, really. There's Hunchly. Turn automatic capture on. Latest OSINT news. All right. So Hunchly's capturing away, doing its thing, right? Just like always. And I always forget that the Ubuntu bar is up here. See that? Just like normal. And I'm in my browser right now, right? I'll switch over to Aleph just so you see that. This is no like no trick there. This is literally how cool Chasm is, is this is all through my browser, right? And it is all running in a secure container. Okay? So I can do all of my regular investigative work within that VM. Oh, see, I get confused. <laughs> right? I can browse around, do my thing. If I get popped, someone hacks me, is right inside of this container. Now, the other thing that I can do is, for example, 
while I'm doing my work, maybe I got to jump into a Telegram chat or maybe I got to go somewhere that's a little darker and nastier. So what I can do is I can switch back to my workspaces view, right? And we're going to fire up Kali Linux too. And I can just pop open Telegram in its own session. So let me grab my little burner phone here. All right. Now I'm going to go start messaging. Boom. Now I'm in a Telegram session in its own isolated container. So if, for example, something happens to me in this Telegram instance, it, they're not going to hit my investigative data in my Hunchly desktop, right? They're not going to be able to see that. And this is a conversation I've had for years with researchers is that like, what happens if my VM where I'm doing my investigative work gets popped? It's like, well, they're going to be able to see your investigation data. They're going to be able to see everything. But now what I can do is I can work back and forth if I need to use messaging clients or maybe I need to use a different tool and I don't want to expose my investigative VM to it, I can do that. So in here, so for example, I can scroll through. This is a great channel, by the way, uh, this uh, OSINT channel. So I'll just find something here. Oh, here, look, Kirby's guide, Kirby Plessis, uh, her guide on OSINT lovers gift guide. So I'm going to copy this link. Look at how seamless this is. Jump back into my Hunchly desktop. Boom, right? Or I can open that in an isolated browser on its own. I don't have to open it in Hunchly first, in my Hunchly desktop first, right? So the other cool thing is naturally, you can have other desktop images deployed. So if you wanna jump in and maybe you've got some recon tools or something that you wanna run, I think I scrolled past uh, Kali. There's Kali. There are certain restrictions and things if you gotta to run tools as root. Again, the Chasm team, uh, are you can reach out to me and I can connect you with them. Boom, there's my Kali desktop. I can jump in. I can start running like OSINT tools. I can fire up Multigo if I want from within this container. Right, I can do a bunch of stuff here. And then the cool thing is, is that I can export this data out if I need to. I can pull data from here. I can push it into my other container if I need to. So if, for example, you're a Hunchly user and you're looking at this going, okay, well, how do I get my case data out of these secure containers? Very easily. So let's switch back to our Hunchly. And you can see they have a whole Docker Hub listing of apps and stuff that they have. Truly amazing stuff. So I'm going to switch back to my Hunchly desktop real quick. All right. So now we're in our Hunchly uh, container here. I want to get this stuff out. So maybe I just want to grab this one page, common thing, right? You do a bit of research work securely. I just want to pull that one page capture out. So I'm going to go page export, put it in my downloads folder, hit OK. All right. Now for my little Chasm toolbar, I'm going to hit download. All right, anything in your downloads folder is there. So I'll just pull that PDF down. Now you can see it's on my host computer. Perfect. Maybe I do a longer running investigation, right? Maybe I do a full investigation in this session. I can hit export, export case, pop it into my downloads. All right, and then I can just pull that case export down. Maybe I didn't need to do any of that stuff. I just needed to do some quick research and I didn't want to expose myself uh, to you know, uh, being de-anonymized or whatever. Uh, Chasm can work in a whole bunch of different ways with VPNs and a, all the neat stuff that we need. But now I've got my Hunchly case I've pulled out of it. And quite literally, I can either let those containers expire, just let them go, or I can go, okay, kill them. Kill it with fire. It's gone. Kill my Hunchly desktop gone, right? I can jump back into my Telegram app if I need some more chatting or I need to talk to a source or whatever it might be. When I'm done, it's gone, right? That's it. It's that fast. If I need a new investigative VM, I just fire it back up. Literally, brand spanking new, right from scratch, voila, I have a brand new fresh environment where I can start doing Hunchly research again. You can think about deploying custom tools in there, custom desktops like CSI Linux and other stuff where you can really begin to see that not only does this provide security, it provides a level of anonymization and unattributable browsing. It also gives you the ability 
to isolate, which is a major problem for us where, uh, you know, just thinking about that isolation between Telegram, what I'm doing maybe with a source or looking at, you know, extremist content or other stuff or uh, doing something specifically in a Tor browser. That isolation between those activities is extremely important. And really the crucial thing, if you're on this call right now or this webinar and you're in law enforcement, this can all stay in-house, right? And it can all stay in-country, which is a huge problem because a lot of solutions are either roll your own iron or run a bunch of virtual machines in-house, or you have to like, go through the, a bunch of hoops to try to figure out if you can even use a provider because you don't know where the data is being hosted, right? So they give you this ability both to run on infrastructure that's deployed out in the cloud, infrastructure in-house, uh, and they can do anything from managing that infrastructure for you to having you do it on-premise. It's truly one of the most amazing things ever uh, that I've seen in, in the OSINT space. Uh, it's just incredible and it fits perfectly with what we need to do as investigators and of course match made in heaven for Hunchly. it is like the perfect spot to do this type of work so please if this interests you in any way reach out to me justin at hunch.ly i'll throw my email in uh, i'm happy to connect you to the chasm team feel free to go to their website too so uh, i'm just going to close this tab uh, it's just chasm web yeah, i'm going to leap there's our YouTube channel. I'll just show you chasmweb.com. Very, very cool stuff. And they are all, the, the team there are brilliant. Brilliant. Uh, come from kind of the same background as me in the cyber hacking space. They get it. Uh, so this is great stuff. Definitely feel free to check that out or reach out to me. And we're actually getting very close to the top of the hour. And I have talked, it feels like, nonstop. Uh, all right, let me uh, let me answer some questions, and I'm going to just review some of the Hunchly resources we have out there. If you're not aware of them, is it possible to export a Hunchly report from the Chasm instance to our host? Absolutely, you can totally do that. So you can just export the PDF to your downloads folder, download it like I showed you from Chasm. Now you got the report on your local machine, and you can blow away that container if you need to. You bet. All right, exactly what we need is what I heard from one person. Uh, the costs are something that I can't answer, so it's definitely worth talking, uh, and I can connect you with their team there to talk about costs for Chasm. It depends on your deployment, depends on how you use it. Awesome. Yeah, so uh, is it uh, someone had also mentioned like um, bringing in images like the Trace Labs uh, images? Uh, I mean, Again, I think that that's probably something they can do. I can tell you that when I showed them Hunchly, uh, literally they blew my mind. They very quickly had a Hunchly environment for me. They're like, yeah, man, this works great with our prop, our platform. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> so it was incredible. So uh, if you have suggestions or other things, definitely uh, let me know. I can connect you with their team for sure. Uh, can I bring the Chasm team in for a webinar? I'm sure I can. They are very, very nice people. Uh, so I will definitely reach out to them. And naturally, uh, I actually don't know if I even warned them that I was going to do this uh, do this webinar. Um, so uh, it was kind of one of those things where I'm like, uh, I've been so excited. I've been talking to tons of people about this, uh, mainly because I see so many applications for Hunchly and Chasm to work together. Um, so definitely, I will, uh, I will connect with them and say, hey, do you want to jump on one of these webinars? And you can do this some proper justice. Um, but really, you can see how easy it is too, right? Like just click a button and like in two seconds, you have this desktop environment that just pops open and away you go, right? Just blew my mind. So uh, very, very cool stuff. Very useful for cyber, for law enforcement. Like there's not a use case I can't think of that can't be enhanced by using it, definitely. Oh, the Chasm team's here. <laughs> yes, our Chasm team will do a joint webinar. Awesome. Thanks, Kevin. <laughs> you did know. <laughs> awesome. That's great. What a surprise. Well, thank you for joining, Kevin. That's uh, that's awesome. That's awesome. Cool. So the Chasm team's here, or some of them anyway. They've been lurking. Uh, that's great. Uh, can you please share a link to the demo? 
Uh, do you mean the demo like my webinar today, or do you want to link to the the Chasm demo, uh, Jim? Awesome. Cool. You're welcome. I'm getting lots of great uh, recording link of this demo. Great. Yes, definitely, and I will definitely connect you to uh, connect you to their team as well when you're ready. Perfect. Okay. Any other questions, feedback, anything before I just wrap up with some Hunchly resources? Awesome. Yeah, I'm getting a lot of people yelling at me in the question and answers box that this is awesome. Oh my God, this is amazing. So yeah, great, uh, both for Aleph and for Chasm. So I'm glad, uh, you know, I always have a, I'm always a little nervous when I demo other people's stuff because you know, I want to make sure that I do a good job and, and that you uh, you get kind of the, the, you know, you get the excitement and everything that I feel about using things like uh, Chasm and Aleph. Uh, and Aleph is Dockerized, so you know the Chasm folks might already be like, yeah, you can probably just spin that up inside of the Chasm in infrastructure. Again, I'm a total Docker noob, so um, I really don't know how that all works. All right, cool, cool. Yeah, lots of okay. I'm gonna, I'm getting lots of. Oh my God, this is amazing. So I'm gonna move on <laughs> very quickly. So our Hunchly YouTube channel is right here. This recording from today will be posted there. So uh, I'm just gonna pop it into the chat for you. Also, all of our previous videos for desktop training, Multigo stuff, uh, dark web stuff, all of that is here. So feel free to jump in there uh, if you want some additional stuff or you really feel like listening to me ramble on for even longer than I did today. Definitely check that out. We also have Hunchly.training. So we've started to train people on how to use Hunchly in some wild and wonderful ways like codeless automation. Uh, you know, collaboration work, Hunchly and Flask. So Flask is a Python framework, which would allow you to kind of use the Hunchly data forwarding and do some really neat stuff with it. Uh, if that's of interest, we do. I've been taking emails from folks who are starting to build out a bit of Elasticsearch infrastructure and other stuff. Naturally, you can actually use Hunchly, Flask and Aleph. Uh, in a in an automated way so you can have like real-time browsing stuff and images and videos being sent to Aleph in real time so Phil did an amazing job there uh, very cool stuff Hunchly.training our knowledge base at support.hunch.ly we uh, update this a lot so if there's changes or things that we've seen or more guidance definitely check there in particular our integration section, so using the Multigo transforms, doing Hunchly data forwarding, all stuff there that a lot of people like digging into. So all of this stuff is open and available for you as well. So again, uh, I'd sent out earlier the, the sign up for the Hunchly report builder, the pre-release and a feedback form. Feel free to get signed up and go take it for a spin. Send us some feedback about Hunchly. We always want to know what's working for you, what's not working for you. Um, and please, I'm going to just drop my email one more time here. Justin at hunch.ly. Send me an email. You got questions about Aleph, Chasm? Whatever it is, uh, I always want to hear from you, so feel free to flood my inbox, and uh, I will do some uh, connecting or quarterbacking or connect you with people on my team or other teams, whatever I can do to help. And naturally, I also want to hear uh, if you have ideas for future webinars. It sounds like everybody wants another webinar on Aleph, and everybody wants another webinar on Chasm. So I already got a couple webinars that, will be, uh, that we can look at down the line in 2022, and... Thank you again for hanging out with me for an hour. I know this was like a wild tour of some very cool stuff, a report builder, which is amazing, and all this other thing, uh, these other tech. Like, it's just, yeah, amazing stuff. So not always easy to cover, but you all hung in there, which is great. And I am, unless I see some questions coming in, which I don't, it looks like you all are ready to jump off, and so am I. So thank you so much again. I hope to see you on the next one, and I'm going to uh, start working on getting this recording online for folks. All right? Thank you so much. Have a good one. Bye-bye.